Our next guest is a previous UFC champion who has just recently kicked off his new podcast along with being added as a playable character to the new EA UFC game. It's our pleasure to welcome El Guapo Bass, written to Submission Radio. Bass, welcome to the program. You're hey, you're very welcome. I'm always happy to be on your uh, you guys' show. Excellent. You are definitely one of our favorite guests to get on. So it's 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 already a party now. The boss is here. Before we get into it, we're very excited to see you as a part of the new EA UFC game. How did this come about? And have you had any hands-on experience playing with the game yet? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, it's I, I think uh, it was Dana like six months or eight months or nine months ago. He called me and he says. We need you in the game. <laughs> and I mm. go, yeah, of course. He says, you got to keep it quiet, though. Now, and then, yeah, everything started. And I went for the first time. I did all the stuff at EA Sports. It's in Vancouver. Um, that was like last month. I went there for like a whole day. And they do interviews and they go in depth about everything. And uh, that's where I played the game for the first time. And uh, I, I liked it a lot. So, with, with obviously you being in the game, liver kicks are plenty. Uh, did you actually do any motion capture in EA Sports? Did, you, did they get you to do any of that stuff so it's authentic? No, no. They, they did not do that. But I'm going to have to come in for another day next week. And uh, there's very much, uh, hope, hopefully, something is going to happen that we do. Because it, it, it's right in, everything is in one building. If you see that building from EA Sports, it's just insane. It's so big, so large. And uh, they have a whole uh, motion cap studio there that actually really big studios, film studios, use as well. So it's uh, high tech. And hopefully I can get in there a few times or just one time and show like the boss with the neck rank, the boss with an exorcist move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'd be awesome if those made into the game. Obviously, you know, with you, it's kind of like a complete package. You've obviously got your person out. Like, you, you know, you've, you've got the, the moves, you've got the, the leg split in the air, the jumping leg split. Did you do any voiceover work for the game by any chance? Is there any, you know, Godspeed and party on in the game? Uh, no, not not for now, but it's very possible that that's next week that it's on 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 my program as well on my uh, list of to do things. I have to speak and the last game. Let me see. Then I was in 2011 or 2012 when we were shooting. Uh, uh, Here comes the boom. I did the voiceovers for the Pride version of the mm. UFC game together with Stephen Quarles. That was a lot mm. of fun as well. Yeah, that was fun playing the Pride version. Now the other big news is that MMA fans are really excited about is your new podcast with Amaro Ronella. You guys obviously have a great dynamic from your Pride commentating days. Tell us, how did this podcast come together? You know, this is going on for years. This, mm -hmm. this, we, we talked about doing radio when we were working together at uh, Pride, you know, and, um, and I'm so fortunate to have to put, uh, uh, I'm so proud of that, that I put Morrow in, in his job, in the job that he belongs to. He was just an enormous talent. I met him a long time ago in Vancouver when we were shooting a, 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 for a, a very bad uh, movie. They, we were shooting a fight scene. We were doing the commentary for a fight scene. And they would later, that's what they told us, build a fight scene around our commentary. I say, you know, this is huh. never going to work, right? So, But anyway, Morrow and I hit it off. And I got his number, and years later, four years later, they asked me if I know somebody because they wanted to replace Stephen Quadros. If I knew somebody, I, I didn't give him his name yet because I was, uh, you know, I was close to Stephen as well, and I didn't want Stephen to think that I maybe had something to do with it. And uh, but then the next guy they had, they had Damon Perry. They didn't like him, and then they asked me again. I say, yeah, actually, I do have a guy. I hope the number still works, and and I got, oh, I, I got him. And now wow. he's in, and now he's doing he's doing everything. He's doing Showtime. He's doing the biggest boxing matches with you know, I mean, with Mayweather. Mm. And now he's doing mm -hmm. WWE as well. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, he's on top of the world right now as a commentator. Probably the best guy out there. Well, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. He's doing WWE SmackDown, which is you know, for for fans who don't follow wrestling, it's a major position. You know, it's also a role that requires a lot of travel and time on the road. How will you guys be able to record the show between you know his and your your super busy schedules? We well, he 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 negotiated it also with the WWE. He comes home on the Tuesday of a Wednesday morning, and that's when we both, you know, we meet at this place. He lives close to me. That's why it was so stupid that we didn't do this sooner. He lives 50 minutes away from me. He moved to Simi Valley. I'm in Westlake Village, which is 50 minutes away. So I drive over there around noon, and then we start doing everything, you know. And then hopefully we we get a rep that day. And if it doesn't rep that day, we do it on Thursday. Thursday was the day that we wanted to come out with the podcast. Yesterday we released it a little sooner. 
So mm. let let the fans know, obviously, where exactly can they find it? How how often is it coming out? And what exactly are you guys talking about? Because we imagine it to be very MMA focused, but or, or is it sort of like a variety hour? We talk about a bit of everything. Yeah, we'll talk about everything in life. Right now, of course, it started with some MMA guys. Um, uh, yeah, Don Fry on the show. We had Don Fry on the show, you know, and yesterday we had Rico Verhoeven, mm. uh, which is very important. J- Daniel Jacobs, we had him on last week. He's the he's the first cancer survivor who actually became world champion boxing, and he was a very well spoken guy. Uh, Rico uh, Verhoeven, the world champion kickboxing heavyweight champion, probably the best guy out there right now. Mm. We had him on for this podcast, and then we talk about everything. We talked about the the Golden Globes. We talk about Nick Diaz, by Dillashaw, Cruz, Showtime boxing. I mean, you name it. You know the 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 the, the, the Golden Globes, um, and I, I mean, who got the Golden Globe? What happened at the Golden Globe? Ricky Gervais, how funny he was again. You know, mm. David Bowie passed away. We talk about that. We talk about Pride One a long time ago. That we, uh, you know, the, when it started with Hickson and Takara, and we have a little clip of that, a sound clip. We talk about steroids, you know, and always the people go like, "Boss, I know, I never use steroids in my uh, in my in my." competition and I, I and because yesterday he asked me he said so you never use I said no never use I said whoa, whoa wait I take that back and he says what do you mean I said well I started use like a year ago for my neck surgery after I came out of my neck surgery I did um, I did some testosterone I said but two and a half months ago I stopped with that because everything got high like my heart rate got high my, my blood pressure was high um, and 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 when I stopped I mean three weeks later everything back to normal so um, I was also very tight my muscles were hurting it's uh, I, I didn't like it at all I feel much better right now mm. well you mentioned the Golden Globes so I have to quickly ask you the Martian winning best comedy I mean Martian's not oh, a comedy right boss you know I didn't get that joke in the beginning but then I realized that he was nominated for best what? comedy. Musical. What was that? It's like it makes you think. Like, did they want the mar- like? They were like, all right, we can't put you in drama because we expect someone else from the category to win, but you can win in this other category where we don't have as many people. Because it was crazy. He won the best actor in in the comedy, and he they also won the best movie in comedy. But it wasn't a comedy, was it? It wasn't a comedy. You know, they they pulled that stunt uh, one time with Jim Carrey. Remember, it was Man on the Moon. Mm-hmm. They also make that a comedy. It was a total <laughs> drama as well. I think this is just a great way. It, it, it's it's unfair. That's what I'm saying. It's unfair because of the people who did a musical or comedy. They should have that chance. Mm-hmm. On the other side, they probably thought, okay, DiCaprio is really good. Matt Damon is almost equal. Uh, let's let's put him in there. It's still a Golden Globe, and it's still for acting. So uh, you know, it should count as much. But it was it was funny how Ricky Gervais said that. Yeah, it's very bizarre. Now, Buzz, jumping into the world of MMA, obviously this New Year's, uh, the new promotion Rise and held their shows with, you know, Fedor winning his return to MMA. You know, a, a, an interesting and bizarre performance from Gabriel Garcia, uh, difficult to watch beatdown of Sakuraba. Bob Sapp, you know, he won his fight, and then obviously King Mo winning the heavyweight tournament. Now that it's all said and done, what did you think of the show? I mean, you, you've probably covered it in your podcast with Morrow, but give us the goods. What did you think? No, we we didn't watch it. You know, it's wow. uh, I, I heard about it. We we I, I I didn't watch it. You know, we um uh, both <laughs> Mar and I both boycotted it. I guess because there's one person involved there in that organization that we really don't like. We and, just you know, we just spoke to him before. Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> man. It's, but anyway, let go, let go, and that is. Uh, but you know, hey, power to them if they can do another show. I I didn't hear great things about it, and I figured, you know what, I'm not going to watch it. Mm. I mean, Fedor easily you would have heard or maybe seen some highlights. Fedor easily won his fight. A lot of big negative backlash from fans and social media who were sort of annoyed seeing Fedor fight people who weren't anywhere close to his level. I'm just wondering, Bas, do you think Fedor taking such lesser competition could possibly hurt fans' perception of him? Because there's a definite negativity going around the internet after that. No, I, I uh, yeah, for for the fans, yeah, but to me, no. To me, this is a normal thing. To me, this is like, uh, okay, let's see if the body holds up in training. You know, he didn't know if that was going to hold up, and then still fighting. Maybe I'm still hoping. You know, I rem- I said it here on this show as well. It's the conspiracy theory f- theory <laughs> for us. Of course. Hopefully, he fights two or three fights, and then he gets released. And if he feels good, he comes to the UFC. That was. Kind of what I was hoping for. I was hoping that he's not going to, you know, sign for a long contract. Just a couple of fights and then have the power to get out of that contract 
and to and to see, you know, to feel first out. Are, am I feeling good? Am I all my reflexes there? Yes, it is. Okay, let's see if what I can do in the UFC. Yeah, it's 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 a fan's dream. I mean, we spoke to uh, you know Jerry Millen just before, and he kind of said that it, it is unlikely to happen just because of. I guess the way sort of Fedor feels about the UFC. But, I mean, hey, here's the thing. Sometimes the UFC comes to you. You know, Vanderlei Silva, you know, not long ago got announced that he's officially been released from his UFC contract. He's free to basically do whatever he wants. Do you think that's something that's going to happen? Vanderlei goes over to Ryzen. They make Vanderlei Silva versus Fedor fight. And is this something that would get you excited, Bas? Yeah, it would be a good fight. I would like to see uh, Vanderlei over there. You know, and, and, and as for the talk about uh, the UFC, I don't care what you think about the UFC, but everybody knows that in order to, to, absolute, to be considered the best in the world, you're going, going to have to go to the UFC. I mean, right now it's head and shoulders above everything else. So, I mean, I truly believe so that a fighter at the end of the career, you know, it's always going to nag at him if he never went to the UFC. Mm. You've obviously dealt with Dana quite a bit. He's a nice guy. Me and Casper spent some time with him here in Melbourne. But do you think he needs to do something special to get a fader over there? Obviously, the deals that he offers him are the same as a lot of other fighters. Do you think he does sort of have to go out of his comfort zone and roll out the red carpet, and so to speak, to get fader onto the company? No, if, if, if fader would uh, be like two really good guys now, yeah, then mm. he can do that. But otherwise, why would he do it? He, he, he lost against Dan Henderson, against Bigfoot, you know, for Doom, who's the champion right now. So he mm-hmm. lost a lot of star power, so to say, negotiating power. That's what I should say. Star power, to me, is the same. Mm. He's still an unbelievable fighter. But, uh, yeah, negotiating power, he lost it right there. Well, the other big potential fight for Fedor could be against Alistair Overeem. You know, if Alistair Overeem decides to leave the UFC, do you think Overeem stays in the UFC? And if he does fight Fedor, just wondering, your expert analysis, who wins that match in your opinion? How, how do you think that would go down in 2016? Um, I, I, I think Overeem is going to stay at the UFC. I, I truly believe that because he's one or two fights away from... Uh from have a title fight, you know, mm. they, they already can do it now if they want, but I would love to see him fight Stipe Miocic. I think that would be a really good fight, these two guys. And then as for Fedor, well, the, it's it's all about what, what's going to happen. Like, listen, anything that um, Overeem does is dangerous. Mm. Every strike he throws, whether it's a knee, elbow, punch, kick, whatever it is, if it connects, it connects, and that could be lights out. But you know, Fedor's been known for being a very tough guy, and he's going to push the fight. He's going to be in there the whole time. He's going to come forward swinging with big punches, and he's got a lot of power, and he's got a very good aim, and then he's going he's to look for the clinch. I, I totally believe that he's not going to strike with him because uh, over him is the, the more qualified striker, although that Fedor is really good in uh, not loading up his punches and having a lot of power, and uh, his aim is really good. So that uh, that balances things out. But I think that um, throwing big shots and going in for a clinch and go for a takedown, I think that uh, could give Fedor the win. On the other side, for Doom is now off for Doom. Sorry, Overham is doing so well at Greg Jackson's. Mm. You know, it's a it's a hard fight to call. We we have to see first. Fader in another fight against a uh, stronger opponent. Mm. It's interesting because, I mean, this happened a while ago, but the Overeem Junior Dos Santos fight was a ex- very strange fight. Obviously, it turned out nothing like most people thought. Mm. Just wondering, what did you think of this whole performance by Junior Dos Santos? And are you on the sort of same boat as a lot of people saying that possibly because of all the damage that he's taken in his previous fights, we may never see the same Junior Dos Santos again? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. You know, it's what I said before the fight. I said, you know, I, I thought if, if Junior fights like he fought like he did in the beginning before everything happened with Cain Velasquez, you know, I, I thought that he, he could beat over him, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, over him, learn now, you know, to stay calm, stay relaxed, don't waste a lot of energy and just pick your shots. And he picks them really well. And uh, for um, Junior Dos Santos, yeah, I think it's going to be a very hard road back for him if – He's even going to make that because uh, th- this was not a good, uh, not a good fight for him. Mm. It's it's interesting because obviously you mentioned Overeem's made some good changes and he's a lot more calmer. But there's still a consensus from fans that although he is on a bit of a streak, the last few fighters that he fought weren't to the level of a Stipe Miocic or a, even a Fabrizio Vadum or a Cain Velasquez. Do you think that he's actually made the changes where he can actually hang in there with those guys? 
Well, he should. Yeah, I, I, I have to give him that. You know, he grew a lot. He, he did much better. Uh, like I said, he became a more calculated, calculated fighter, which is logic if you try to get the Jackson Winklejohn over there. The, the, these guys, once they get inside your head and they, they can switch it around a little bit, that's really good for you. Trust me, you, you become a better fighter. So, yeah, he still, of course, has a chin, uh, not, uh, not a strong chin. That's the one thing. He cannot get hit. You know, because that could be a problem for him. But right now, he's back to basics. Pretty much what he did when he was with the Golden Glory guys. Single attacks. That's the most important thing for a guy who has uh, less of a chin. You know, you always want to have one hand at your chin. And when he fought like that, he just terrorized everybody. Once he steered away from it, once he left that camp in Holland, he started experimenting with other fighters and everything. I guarantee you that in, in training, he would just school these guys. No one would really give him any pressure back. And that's when you fight a high-level guy in the UFC. Yeah, you're going to get knocked out. Once you start throwing combinations like you're doing with less skilled fighters, that, you know, that could be very dangerous. And, uh, and I think that's what happened. And I think that uh, uh, Jackson Winklejohn saw that. They started talking to him again. And everything is coming back together now. Mm. I think also getting off of all the PEDs makes him faster, you know. And, and especially now I notice this myself. Like, I, I'm... I, I don't get it that fighters actually would do it because it's it makes your muscles so tight, your hamstrings, everything. You know, I think you're much looser now, and uh, more, that that will give you more explosive power. I truly believe so. Yeah, well, everything definitely seems to be coming together really nicely for Overeem. Another thing, uh, another interesting situation in the UFC title picture that we got to get your thoughts on is obviously Conor McGregor fighting for Rafael dos Anjos at UFC 197. You've said it to us before. You love that phrase. We're not here to take part. We're here to take over. We take you're a big McGregor fan. What do you think about this as the next matchup for McGregor? Do you think it's the right one? You know, it's uh, he's grabbing high, man. If he goes for something, he's going for the stars because <laughs> mm. Los Angeles. He's a uh, he's a really tough guy. You know, I didn't I didn't see it coming that he would beat Pettis, and once he did that, I go, whoa, you know. And then against Cerrone, who was on a roll. And just just terrorized everybody, and then just knocking him out. Ooh, I I now you know it's going to be a very hard guy to beat. Now on the other side, you you're going to have a very confident guy coming in who fights a weight class higher now, so he's going to feel stronger because the last time we saw McGregor fight, he was really dehydrated. I mean, if you would if I would have seen him on the street on the day of the weigh-in, I yeah. don't think I would have recognized him. He was <laughs> so you know so dry, so to say. Mm. And uh, so I, I think this actually will help McGregor. It's, it, it will make him a stronger fighter. And, um, and then we're going to see. But can he then deal with the constant pressure of Rafael Dos Anjos? Because he will be in your face the whole time. And that's why he beat Pettis. And that's probably he's going to do the same. And he has got the stamina to back it up for five rounds. If McGregor wins this thing, man, that's, that, will be, that will be something. Well, it's never been done before. We all know that. And especially, you know, he predicts everything. So I wonder what he's going to predict for this fight, what round and how. Do you do you think, like, because obviously in in his career, a lot of the, when he sort of started out, when he was on the sidelines and he said he was going to, you know, kill everyone in the featherweight division, everyone laughed it off and, you know, he was sort of like a big joke. And then he started backing up everything that he said and, you know, people started really coming around. And now he's sort of at that point where people are like, holy crap, this guy is, you know, very much legit. But going up in weight, it's a huge deal. So I think a lot of people now, again, he's kind of, if it was maybe Frank Edgar or another featherweight, people say, okay, he's going to win. But now that it's lightweight, people are sort of like, okay, this might be where the, the road ends for McGregor. If he beats Rafael, do you think he sort of entered that Anderson Silva zone where, not I'm not comparing them in skill-wise, but where he'd always be the favorite and like no one would really doubt him much anymore? Yeah, you can. You never can g- gamble against him again. Uh, then if he if he beats Rafael Dos Anjos. Mm. I mean, he beat two top guys. He beat a guy who was undefeated for 10 years. You know, and, and, and now Rafael Dos Anjos, I mean, he went steamrolling through everybody. I mean, stopping, uh, of, of, uh, stopping Cerrone. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. He's a super talented guy. So if he stops him or just wins the fight and then in two different weight classes and then the way he said it and he came on, the way he came into the UFC, the, you know, he backed everything up. Yeah, the, mm. you can never gamble against him anymore. A lot of people saying it's a strategic move by the UFC because obviously the fight with Frankie Edgar 
incredibly tough. But if he does go up and win the title at lightweight or even um, lose to RDA, there's still the excuse that, well, he went up a weight class or, oh, well, at least he's now the lightweight champion if he loses to Frankie Edgar. Do you sort of see, see that? In a strategic sense, moving up to fight RDA is sort of a smarter one than sticking around and fighting Frankie Edgar because that's a really tough matchup to have. It is. Um, I don't know. Frankie Edgar was a real tough matchup also because he will get constant pressure as well. But RDA is the same. You know, I don't know who skill-wise would have the better takedowns. Probably Edgar, I think, but I don't, I don't know. Dos Anjos, <laughs> he keeps surprising me every time I see him. <laughs> the guy's getting better all the time. So I, I don't think it really matters. I, I think, like you said, if he, if he would lose in the heavier weight class, he can always go back to the other class. He says, okay, well, this is not my weight class. You know? But if he wins, what is he going to choose then? Is he going to stay there or is he going to go back and forth? We don't know. There's a lot of exciting things, you know, a lot of exciting factors attached with this fight, and especially McGregor, because obviously, you know, it's fun to see him chasing these titles, but it's almost like there's a bit of a shift where people are saying, this might be the guy who finally pushes the UFC to sort of do co-promotion. It seems like that's his aim. I don't know if you saw, but he released a sort of press statement for UFC 197. Uh, I think he was calling himself McGregor, McGregor Entertainment or McGregor Sports Inc., and he was saying how McGregor Sports Inc. will be putting on this fight. Didn't mention the UFC at all except that it was going to be for the UFC title. What do you think about that? I mean, people are talking about how powerful this guy is and, you know, uh, that he's sort of calling the shots. What do you think about that notion? Do you think co-promotion will ever happen? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I do believe that he holds all the cards now. You know, he's so... Everybody wants to see him. Whether you want to see him win or lose, it doesn't matter. You want to see him. And I don't know, what, what were the pay-per-view buys in the last uh, show? I, I, I never got that. Do you guys know the numbers? No, no one knows for sure, but when we spoke to Dave Meltzer, he was estimating around about 1.1, 1.2 thereabouts. That was an estimate. You see, so that's, we're talking about like four, 500,000 more pay-per-view buys than a normal show would have hmm. lately then, right? Because in the early days, yeah, we had shows 1.3, 1.6 actually, and 1.1. I think those are the records. Mm-hmm. But I think McGregor, if he fights again against Rafael dos, uh, Rafael dos Anjos, the way he promotes it, that could be a 1.5, 1.6. It could break the records. And wh- why not tell as a fighter, say, okay, yeah, normally you get like four bucks or 375 per pay-per-view buy. I don't know what the contract says. But he can say, okay, wh- what about w- once we go past 1.2 million, everything after that, I just want half. You know, and uh, they're going to be stupid to say no. Because if they say no, they're going to miss out on all that money. If they say yes, it's going to be great for them and it's going to be great for McGregor. And that will open barriers also for bigger paydays. But then now also everybody has the blueprint of McGregor. You know, I I heard Diaz saying, um, Nate, he said, yeah, we kind of gave him the blueprint um, the way he presents himself. That's absolutely not true. He doesn't use any profanity. He's very smart in everything what he's saying and the way he's attacking, he's doing it completely different mm. and he's doing it very smart. And I think that more fighters should start taking a look at that and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, yes, it, 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 it's a fight and I understand that. But, you know, if you want to make more money, well, you're going to have to tone it up a little bit. Mm. You mentioned how, obviously, he loses these huge amounts of weight to be at 145. And John Kavanaugh, his coach, basically said after his last fight that was going to be his last fight at 145 because of, obviously, the damage and the toll that it takes on McGregor health-wise. I'm just wondering, Bas, do you think going up and down in weight between featherweight and lightweight can even be a bigger health hazard for McGregor? Because here you're building up muscle and you're going up a weight class and then you're coming all the way back down to featherweight, losing even more weight back and forth. Well, if he's smart, he's not going to gain muscle. If he's smart, he's going to stay exactly the same and feel just much better, give your body what it wants. I mean, you're going to feel so much better. People have no clue. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, I don't think, but if he, if he decides to pack on muscle to make more weight and then he has to cut the same amount what he did now, I wouldn't suggest that. I would suggest going up, just stay the same, man. 10 pounds, trust me, it's not going to do a lot of difference. With obviously, you know, him potentially going up in weight and going back down weight, I mean, if, if he's smart and he does it right, it's it's a recipe for, for winning. If he doesn't, it could potentially be a recipe for disaster. But here's the crazy thing. Obviously, Rafael Dos Anjos and Frankie Edgar, both extremely tough guys, were all sort of, you know, living the dream on this Conor McGregor train ride at the moment. Do you think it's possible that we see him pick up two losses in 2016 and it's all kind of, you know, over before it even began? 
You know, it's it's very hard to uh, again to gamble against him now. I mean, the, the the stuff that he did and the way he did it, he backed everything up. So I'm not going to say I I thought that he was going to have a really hard time with Aldo, you know, and uh, and he didn't. And if people go, oh, it was lucky. It was no, he was aiming for it. And if you aim for something, you know, I, I explained this morning on my Facebook page a, a story about. I remember I was I was uh, training with uh, sparring with my uh, karate teacher and I was like a blue belt I was not even big and I kicked him in the head and I apologized to him I said sorry it was uh, I got lucky and he goes did you aim for my head and I go yeah and he said well then it was not luck congratulations you did a great job you know and that's the same with McGregor he mm-hmm. aimed for that shot you know and he hit hit it on the top and he, you saw his eyes were glued on him you know if he would have looked away and he would have taken the big swing yeah then I'm gonna say that but this was uh this was getting in people's head, make them angry, let them overcommit to the punches, and take advantage of that. That's what he did. Mm. Well, we just want to quickly get your thoughts before we let you go on the Misha Tate uh, fighting Holly Holm on the event as well. Uh, we spoke to Coach Winklejohn last week who said Misha Tate was more dangerous than Ronda Rousey in many areas. Do you agree, and how do you think this fight goes? Yeah, no, I, 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 don't, uh, I, I don't agree. I, I, I do think, though, that her wrestling has a better, with her wrestling with single X and double X takedowns, because they shoot lower than Ronda, you know, up for the clinch, and then pretty much judo throws, or like a Greco-Roman kind of style. Mm. I think that wrestling is a better approach, yeah, indeed, to uh, face home. Uh, that's what I said after the fight with Ronda Rousey. She would be smart if she, and I, she, she already knows, I guarantee you, that some double and uh, single X, you know, that would be really good for her to add to her repertoire, because that's, that's something that she didn't do before. Now with uh, the footwork, yeah, I don't know. Now, now, now Tate knows the footwork, and you gotta stay on your mm-hmm. toes. So because Tate is also, when I see her, because it's the wrestling, it's like they have flatter foot, uh, flatter feet, especially in the last fight. But she knows this now, so you're probably gonna see Tate on the balls of her foot, moving in and out, and just waiting. I wouldn't start chasing. People know that that's not a good idea. You know, if you chase, well, make sure that it's close somewhere to the cage. Then again, Holm has great footwork. She cuts angles. But if somebody can take her down, that could be Tate, yeah, without a clinch uh, for the double or single leg. That, that's the thing. And Tate's got some power in her hands, but I think that Ronda had more power in her striking. Mm. In so, a single punch that she has. So if you had to make a prediction, what would you say? Do you think it's going to be a quick, a quick and dominant victory for home? No, I don't think so. I think that, uh, yeah, Misha, indeed, because she comes in prepared and she's going to look at the last fight she had against uh, uh, Ronda, Holman mm-hmm. Ronda. And she, so she, there's going to be a lot of in and out movement with her. She has to because uh, – and then if it goes to the ground, yeah, we're going to see a longer fight. But, um, yeah, Holm I, – I, after the, the – the thing that Holm did with uh, Rousey, you know, it's very hard to bet against Holm now. Mm, for sure. But then we always were betting against the <laughs> other opponents with uh, Ronda Rousey, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, Misha Tate's incredibly tough, so it should be in a oh. very exciting fight. Finally, before we let you go, Bas, we saw you're working uh, with an app called Talk to Legends where all the proceeds go into charity. Can you explain this for the fans? Yeah, they, they contacted me and they said, you know, that's a, it's an app that you go to and you, you, you can schedule a time to talk to me and you pay a certain amount of money. I have no clue what the amount of money is. And they said, oh, you can do with the money whatever you want. I said, well, if I do it like that's like me signing autographs. When I'm signing autographs on, on gear that I have at home and I sell that gear, it always goes to charity. Uh, I never want to make money with an autograph. And it's the same with this talking. You know, I say, okay, I'm going to jump on that and I will talk to the fans. And then the money goes to charity. Maybe that you know, sparks them a little bit more to talk to me because it's going to a good thing mm-hmm. and, uh, and and they can talk to me. <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, guys, go to BassRoon.com as well for all of Bass's latest products and don't forget to grab the O2 Trainer. It's fantastic and follow Bass on Twitter at BassRoon MMA. Obviously, the podcast is Can't Miss. That comes out every week. Now, what's the best day for them to check that ad, Bass? Is that Thursday uh, in America? Yeah, Thursday, but sometimes Wednesday evening, like yesterday, Wednesday evening. Rutan and Ronello spelled out, dot com. You know, and if you, it's, it's on iTunes. Uh, I think it's going to be on today. The, on SoundCloud, it's already on. And on iTunes is the first show. And the second one is probably going to be on today or tomorrow. It takes like one day in order to go to iTunes. So, yeah, Thursday, Thursday should always be good. But sometimes we're lucky and we do it Wednesday evenings. 
Fantastic. And that would be because of the time difference here in Australia. That would be Friday. So, Bass, we're super happy to see you and uh, you and Morrow back. The A-Team is back in action, doing your podcast weekly. And uh, once again, it's a great pleasure. Thank you so much for coming back to the show. You're very welcome, guys. Godspeed, everybody. Godspeed, everybody.